Welcome here. Uh, I'm Pastor Joel, and uh, so glad to, to be here today, and uh, glad to have another one of uh, my nieces here today, uh, Allison and her husband. Glad to have y'all here uh, today. Um, I come from a big family, and so if all y'all leave the church, I'm just going to start a f- church with my family, because there's a lot of them there. Um, they, they come because uh, uh, I guess they love me, not because I'm a good pastor, but no, so glad that you guys are, are here today, and uh, we do want to welcome all of you here. Um, I was thinking about uh, all of those who watch online every week, and Mike said a word uh, about them, and, and you guys gave them some love with a hand clap, or, and uh, I just want to say uh, that they are such a special group, and many of them I talk to uh, during the week, and they contact me, and uh, they are looking forward to when they can come back and get in to the house uh, here at Grace Chapel. And, uh, but, but I ran into a lady this week, and she was telling me, she said, Pastor, I pray every week during your services. And uh, she said, I pray for you, and I pray that God's word would speak to the people there. And, uh, and also online, but, but right there, those people that are able to be in God's house, that the Lord would just use your messages uh, to speak to them. And so I know we have some precious people who are ready to get back. I know some of them have been able to get the vaccine, and uh, maybe in the next few weeks they'll be able to, to come back. Um, and, and for those of you that don't know, and many of you have come to join our church even in the last few months, uh, but church, let's just be honest, church has been different since last March uh, when we kind of had to stop and go online for a little while and praise the Lord that we had the capability of doing that. Um, and we were able to help some other churches who had not ever been online and we were able to help them and our staff did a great job of helping some other churches uh, get online and, and be able to uh, receive uh, the tithes and offerings uh, which they had never done uh, digitally. So um, we just want to say thank you to all of you uh, who continue to support us during this time. We're still about 300 people short on Sundays of what we were back in March of last year. And so we, we have a lot of people who have not been able uh, to come back. And uh, some may never come back. I, I understand that. Um, but we've had some new people step, come in and join the church, and so God just continues to, uh, to do some amazing things, even in the midst of a pandemic. And so, uh, anyway, we're just so glad that you're here and so glad to have all of you watching online today. Well, we're in a series called Only the Essentials. Pastor Jed mentioned that, looking at what it is, spiritually speaking, that we as believers really need to focus our lives on and I've, I've said this each week we've been in this series that we hear the word essential a lot uh, today we still hear it on the news what's essential and what's not educational wise or, or or maybe essential travel or essential businesses or uh, something like that essential I, I saw an article last week that said the essential impeachment of a former president and uh, you know they use that word essential a lot some think that that's very critical and uh, I think it's a kind of a waste of our money, our pa- taxpayer money myself, but, um, but some people think that's essential. And there'll be those who, for the next several months, kind of build their whole uh, lives around uh, that impeachment trial. In fact, we all build our lives on what we believe is essential, don't we? We believe um, a, a certain thing, and we build our life around that, and uh, what, whatever is key, whatever's critical, what's ever essential to our happiness, to our success. Uh, it may be money, it may be business investments, or maybe it's you build your life around your family or, or your friend group, your peer group, or, or it may be material things. Um, and we don't like to, to think of ourselves like that, but we can't wait to get online so that we can do some more shopping on Amazon or, 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 or something like that. And we build our lives on these things that we can uh, uh, we can shop for and so there's all kinds of things that we build our lives on maybe it's uh, other material things like houses or car you got this dream you you've dreamed about and you want to do this and you kind of build your life around that uh, for a little while two weeks ago we looked at Paul's words when he was talking uh, about uh, materialistically or uh, maybe uh, a better word just physically speaking he said this I've learned 
to be content with just food and clothing. Just food and clothing. I wonder how many of us could be content if all we had was our food and, and clothing. But what is it that is absolutely necessary to be fruitful in the Christian life? Uh, to, to build our lives around what God thinks is, is critically important for us. And it's essential. Um, it's a great question since so many of the non-essential things over the last year or so have been removed from our lives. Those things that we really maybe thought were essential but found out that they weren't essential. We mentioned those a couple of weeks ago and, and I just used the illustration of Starbucks or something and there were those that said, man, I cannot live without Starbucks, right? i got to get my coffee in the morning. And then when Starbucks closed, we realized that we could actually do without it and uh, probably save some money, right? But we, we realized uh, these things that were, were really non-essential, that we thought were essential. But the Bible has some things for us that God says are essential for us in our lives if we will just focus on those and build our lives around those things, God would be pleased. Our key verse for this series comes out of Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, which tells us, by his divine power. Just think about that for a minute. I mean, we think of, of people who are powerful, and we think of politicians and different people in our lives. Maybe you, you feel like somebody in your business where you work is powerful. They're a powerful person. But God's power is different. It's a divine power. And, the, and Peter said, by God's divine power, God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. Everything we need for living a godly life, he's given us. We have received all of this by what? Coming to know him. When we got saved, we, we get this. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Hey, can you pray with me this morning? Father, we just come before you today and ask that you would meet with us for a few minutes. Would the Spirit of God just speak through your word? May it penetrate our hearts today. God, may we walk out of this room different, differently than when we walked in. God, I pray that you would just help us to remove every other thought that's, that's coming into our minds right now. May we focus on what you want us to focus on this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The goal of the Christian life for us is to live a godly life, right? Um, and, and this verse tells us that God has already given us everything we need to fulfill the plan uh, he has for us. In other words, he's already given us the essential things that we need. And we've been kind of going through this in this series. And our first sermon was uh, about grace, the amazing grace of God and how it's essential for us and how we're saved by grace. But not only are we saved by grace, but God wants us to live in this atmosphere of grace. Amen? I mean, isn't it awesome when you are shown grace like somebody in, in, in the church of God shows you grace and you see, and we live in this atmosphere of grace because it's necessary for us to experience it for our salvation, but it's also important that we live in this atmosphere and that it permeates uh, our lives. Then we dove into a pneumatology or the study of the Holy Spirit and how it is essential in the lives of Christians and how God's very spirit indwells us lives inside of us and he comes in at the moment of salvation but that God gives it that that spirit to us to be our helper and our comforter and uh, everyone in here understands that we need help amen we don't need just help we need comfort and God gives us his spirit to comfort us in those times where we need comfort and then last week we talked about how faith is essential in our lives. And today I want to talk to you about the Word of God and how critical and crucial and essential it is for us as Christians. Let me show you this morning how it helps us. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and uh, verse 16 and 17 says this. You probably have heard it before. I'm going to get to Nehemiah chapter 8. If you want to turn to the book of Nehemiah, we'll be there in just a minute. 2 Timothy chapter 3 Verse 16 and 17, 
Paul is speaking to his young protege, Timothy, and he says this, Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial. Uh, not, not all, I, I wrote this in my Bible years ago, someone said it, I'm not really sure who to give credit to uh, for it, but they said this, that all scripture is written to us, um, it is, is not written to us, but is written for us. Think about that. There are parts of the scripture that are written to a certain group of people. Um, and so not all of the scripture is written to us, but it's all written for us. And it's all beneficial for us. Uh, and, and Paul says it's beneficial for teaching, for rebuke. None of us like that. But it censures us and it warns us and it reprimands us sometimes. It, it's good for us because it's good for us to be rebuked sometimes. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but we're not always right. Right? Don't elbow the person next to you. I'm just saying, we're not always right. And sometimes we need rebuked. And we need it from no one more important than, than God. And that's what he does in his word. And sometimes it's given to us for rebuke, for correction. Paul says, for training in righteousness. Whether you admit this or not, when done the right way... Correction, rebuke, discipline is a good thing. Now, we would all say that as parents, right? If we've disciplined our kids so as to correct the behavior that they have, we would all say, well, that's a good thing. But I'm an adult, right? I don't need it anymore. I don't need corrected. I don't need disciplined. I don't need. God says, Scripture is there for that very reason because sometimes we need corrected, sometimes we need discipline. And what, one of the reasons why I think the Bible has so much to say on the subject of pride is because many of us as believers feel like, well, this is not for me. This is not for me. I'm not, I don't need correct. I don't need discipline. I don't need rebuked. Let me go on. It says in verse 17, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. In other words, God's given us the essential of the word of God in order for us to do what he wants us to do, to live the way that he wants us to live. Now, if you're a Christian, you already know that God's word is essential, right? You're like, Pastor, couldn't you come up with something I didn't know today, right? But you already know how important it is uh, for you to be involved with the word of God. After all, the Bible is the very breath of God. It's his uh, words to us. It's called the word of the Lord. Deuteronomy calls it the book of the, the law. Paul calls it the good news of the gospel. Acts calls it the living word of God. Colossians says it's the message of Christ himself. We read that it's referred to as a hammer that crushes evil and, and, and a sword that helps us to defend against the attacks of the world and the flesh and the devil. And James says it's a mirror that shows us what we need to work on. It's called the truth, the word of truth. So most people underneath the sound of my voice this morning would say, yeah, I, I got that, I already, already knew that. And you wouldn't argue with me about the importance of God's word. Now there are some people that may be listening to me today that say, you know, I'm not really sure about the word of God. I, I know what you guys claim it is, and I know you think it's not wrong, and it's all, always right, but I got some questions on that, because I see some things in there that se seem to be a little strange, and you talk about a God who loves and cares for us, but yet at times in Scripture did something over here and did something there, and you're not really sure about that, and most of you, but, but, but most of you would say, you're right, Pastor, the Word of God is essential, and I need it. You, you would admit that. I need it every day. The problem is that what we say doesn't always match up with how we live. Come on. We're, we're, we all have that problem. Is that what we say doesn't always match up to how we live. I, I, I can speak to that on several different levels. And some of you will understand this. But because you're parents, Right? And, and you've, have you ever come to the point where you've said something to your kids about something and then, like, been called out on it, right? 
like, okay, but that's not what you do, Dad. And then you got to take a good look at yourself, right? I mean, what we say doesn't always match up to how we live. In fact, our lives often tell a whole different story. We allow ourselves to be caught up in, in, in these things we feel are essential, but what it proves is that what really captures our heart is often what becomes the focus of our lives. And, and, and let me give you a simple reason why God's word is essential. The Bible is essential because in a world filled with lies, God's word defines what's true. God's word defines truth. Have you ever thought about where it is that you get your uh, view of life? Like, where do, do, does it come from? Where, where does your belief system come from? Where do your perspectives and your opinions come from? Because we all have them, don't we? We all have a belief system. In fact, it's probably never been more uh, visible to everybody else than it is today. Like, if you want to know someone's belief system, follow them on social media. It's really, really easy to figure out what their belief system is. And everybody has a strong opinion. And I guess with social media, where we can hide behind a phone or a computer screen, it's easy to throw out our opinions and our belief system. And it doesn't matter who it hurts. It doesn't matter what, what it, it's like, well, this is what I think. And I don't care what anybody else thinks. And we'll get into arguments and all kinds of things. I know some of y'all are the people that people are shaking their head like, good grief. I mean, they're going to argue about everything in the world. I mean, it doesn't matter if you say this color's red and someone else says it's blue. I mean, they'll argue with you about it, right? And it's probably neither one. I don't know. But, it, but you'll argue with everything about your belief system because we all have strong opinions on what's happening today. This pandemic and masks and social distancing, right? I mean, you can click on and find news things and videos of people who get too close to someone else and they get mad and I mean, yell at people that don't have a mask on, and I mean, they're, they're and, and then God forbid you get into some thing, something on there about politics, right? Because we all have strong opinions on the media and on the economy and on humanity itself and on our government. I mean, strong opinions. You have strong beliefs, and it trickles into the church, right? Like I, I think we ought to do this, and I think. Pastor Jed ought to sing this, and I think Pastor Joel ought to preach on this, and I, it's, it's, I don't think we ought to turn the lights down, and I think the lights ought to be up, and I think the Welcome Center shouldn't be doing this, and, and the people out there shouldn't be sitting down or standing up. Or, I mean, everyone has opinions, and that's why it's important for the church of God, we're going to talk about this next week, but it's important for the church of God to come together, and the Bible says we're, we're, we're many different members, but we become one. And that means that many times we have to give up and surrender our opinions and our belief system and all of those things to keep the peace that Christ wants us to have as a body of Christ. What is it that influences your, your thought process? Think about it. Is it the news? You get all of your information from a couple news organizations or TV social media, your peer group, your parents? Is it your personal experiences, your professors at school? Uh, or maybe it's just your family, what you find out sitting around the dinner table or the living room. And by the way, all of us are influenced by in some way of those things. But the truth is, is that we ought to base our belief system from the word of God. It's the word of God that defines truth. In, in every area of your lives. In fact, over the last year or so, I've talked to, and I've, I've even said this myself, but I've heard it said several times, Pastor, I just don't even know what to believe anymore. Like there was a time where I thought this news agency was the one to believe. And then I realized they said this, and they did this, and now I don't know who to believe. And, and you, got, you got the Democrats saying this, and the Republicans saying this, and then you got groups in, in those different parties that are saying something different. And so it, it's just like, I don't even know what to believe anymore, but it's the word of God that defines what's true in every area of our lives. And if we really believe that the word of God is truth, in John 8, 
verse 32 tells us that we ought to know the truth. And when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Do this for me this morning. I, I want to read a verse to you this morning. And I know this is a little uh, awkward. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. Okay? Now, n- nobody's going to steal your wallet or your purse or anything. Okay? Just close your eyes for a minute. And I want you really to just focus and meditate on this verse that I'm going to read to you. Okay? Just, just focus on this verse that I put, put everything else out of your mind and just ask, let's just let God's word be God's word this morning and let it settle in your heart. If you want, just, just for just a minute, let me read it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Here's what it says. For the word of God is alive. And powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two edged sword, cutting between our soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Think about that. That's what God's Word does. When we read it, you can look up. Everybody still have your wallet. Everybody still have your purse, right? That's what God's word does. It cuts us up. When we read it, it cuts us up and shows us what we need to fix in our lives. Now, with that understanding, turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 8. And I want us to see a true example, a true story out of God's word. It shows us how essential his word is for us as believers. The book of Nehemiah, excuse me, tells this story of the rebuilding of the walls in Jerusalem. They had been taken down by the enemies of God. God raised up a man by the, by the name of Nehemiah. He calls him back uh, to this place and he says, hey listen, I want you to rebuild the walls of this great city. And despite the, the devil's attempts to thwart the building campaign, that they had. In chapter 6, we see that it only took 52 days of God's people working together and the walls were completed. That's Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. We come to Nehemiah chapter 7 and the people are living inside the walls and they're now secure, right? They're feeling pretty good. They're organized. They have housing and food. They have, I mean, the Bible talks about the fact that they got houses. So they're living in the houses, they're not out living in the wilderness, they're not spread out, they're now inside the walls. God is re, kind of reforming the whole, the whole uh, city, the city's alive, but they have a need. They need to build this new community that they have on the principles of God's word. And, 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 but just like today, they had to take some responsibility in it. And what we're going to see is a great example for us to follow, especially in the days that we live in today. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1 says this, and all the people gathered as one person at the public square which was in front of the water gate and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel. Notice That there was a hunger for the word of God. Everybody say hunger. Not hungry. Some of y'all are like, I'm I'm ready to go. Hunger for the word of God. I love looking at that. Do Do you have a hunger for God's word? If you don't, you don't understand the value that his word has for your life. God's words to us are crucial. That's why it's important that we're in his word every day. They're crucial to how we're going to live our lives. They are essential for us to live by. Listen to what the psalmist says. Psalm 19, verse 10 and 11. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, much pure gold. Sweeter also than honey or drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, your servant is warned by them and keeping them there is great reward. Listen to Job. You remember Job, all his troubles. He said this, but he knows the way I take. When he has put me to the test, I will come out as gold. My foot has held on to his path. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not failed the command of his lips. I have treasured 
the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Is that how much you hunger for God's word? Is it more important than lunch today? That you have God's holy word? The psalmist said in 119 verse 162, I rejoice in your word like one who discovers a great treasure. A great treasure. Here's, here's what I think. I think that we've come, we, we have been so blessed with, with having copies of God's word in our hand, in our pocket, at our fingertips all the time that we neglect to understand how important that it really is. You see? And if we didn't have water or food, it wouldn't take us very long to realize how important water and food are. Right? You go a couple days without eating or drinking, you'll realize how important it is. And, and, and what the psalmist here was saying, what Job was saying was, look, it is so important. It's much more important than gold, food, treasure. I believe many in the church today are starving, not for food, but for the word of God. Amen. The people got together and requested Ezra to preach them to them. And I, I just want to say, as a, as a pastor, I can tell you that that doesn't happen too often today. Like, I don't get too many texts or phone calls saying, hey, can you come over and just preach to us? Like, it doesn't happen that way. Do, do you hunger to hear God's word like that? Do you treasure it? Now look back at your Bibles in verse 2 and 3. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. All right? There's your, there, there's your uh, scripture uh, for the reason that we have the nursery. Amen? Yeah, just, but when you leave today, think a nursery worker. For all of those who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month, verse 3, and he read from it before the public square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Not, notice, not only was there a hunger for the Word of God, but there was a hearing of the Word of God. They, they heard, verse 2 and 3, Ezra read God's Word to the people, and the people listened. The Bible says that they were attentive to the Word. And by the way, if you read it, it says there was no time restraint. Right? It, did you see what it said? They went from early morning, early morning to midday. We have some that don't have any problem with slipping in late every week. And if the service goes past an hour and 15 minutes, they slip out. And then somehow feel that they're called by somebody or God, somebody to text me or our staff and, and, and let them know, especially if I preach for more than 40 minutes. Now, now <clears throat> listen, my friends, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We don't have any problem spending two hours watching a, a ball game on Saturday or going to the ball field and watching on. But if we, God forbid, we go more than an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday morning, we got some people who won't come back. And they said, look, from early morning to midday, they just listened to the word of God. Be careful that you don't reluctantly and begrudgingly listen to God's word. Like some of you just need to learn. It's, it's become a habit. It's like about every 10 minutes I see some of you go. They'll pull your phone out. Look and see what time it is. Check your messages. Instead of being focused on the word of God. Oh, we need a hunger for the word of God. And we need to hear the word of God. Then notice next, according to this passage, there was honor given to the word of God. Look back down at verse 4. Ezra the scribe stood at the wooden podium which they had made for the purpose and beside him stood now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher these up if you can do better you can come see me afterwards <laughs> Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkah, Messiah on his right, Padiah, Mishael, Malchishah, Hashem, Hasbadani, Zechariah I'm going to get to my point in just a second Meshalom on his left. Then Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, and he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. 
honor. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. With the raising of their hands, then they kneeled down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodai, Messiah, Kalida, Ezariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and Mike Matson. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and the Levites explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. Notice the response when the word of God was read. In honor to the word of God, all the people stood and the people said, Amen. And amen. That's a Hebrew biblical term that means certainly. In Latin it means so be it. It is a term of agreement. And if pastors and churches would get back to preaching the word of God and focusing on the word of God and stop pushing their own agenda, I believe we would hear more amen and amen. amen, amen, amen. We got pastors today who preach from everything from politics to, to every social uh, a social uh, issue you can think of but only God's word can change a man's heart they got all kinds of these polished speeches and everything else my friend God's word is what can change someone sadly we got people today who call themselves ministers of God who have no biblical training no, no sense and think that the word amen is a masculine gender term can you believe that? And that, that, that we ought to say amen at the end of our prayers and a woman. That's what happened a few weeks ago when Democratic Congressman, the Reverend Emmanuel Cleaver, opened with prayer at the beginning of the 117th Congress. He concluded his prayer by saying amen and a woman. And it makes my blood boil. That's foolishness and it's a mockery of God's holy word. Not only did the people honor his word by standing and saying amen, but they raised their hands. Oh, now you're going to make me uncomfortable, preacher. Just raise your hands in honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the holy God. And then they knelt down. They got on their knees and knelt down to worship God. They weren't sitting around wondering what everybody else was doing. We're all guilty of that sometimes. I ain't going forward because hey, look at all these people in here. I mean, they're all going to look at me and wonder what kind of sin I'm in. What did I, what did I do? Well, that's so bad that I had to go to the front and kneel down. Why don't you quit caring about what everybody else thinks and care what God thinks? Because it shows honor to him when we fall on our knees and our face and worship him. And they heard God's word. It caused them to worship. Think about that. God's, it's God's word that causes men and women to be saved. It's God's word that, that, that raises dead lives and causes dry bones to become alive. It's God's word that changes hearts and causes the blind to see. It's God's word that can restore your marriage and your family. It's God's word that causes us to sing and to praise him and to worship. It's God's word that causes us to live a life of surrender and obedience. They recognize the importance of his word. Psalm 119, 89 says, Forever, Lord, your word stands in heaven. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Yeah. Isaiah 48, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Someone has said only two things last forever, the souls of men and the word of God. That leads me to number four. There was a correct handling of the word of God. Look at verse eight. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. You know what I wrote in my, look, someone had to explain it to them. Not only did Ezra, the priest, the scribe, read God's word, but it was explained in small groups why we have Sunday school class that's why we have grace groups is to explain a little more in more detail the word of God I say this all the time if you think that you're you're making it 
by just coming on Sunday and getting a, a, a sermon on Sunday morning for 40 minutes. On Sunday, you're missing it. You need to be in a grace group. You need to be in a Sunday school class. You need to be in a discipleship class. You need to be in a Christian growth class on Sunday night. You need God's people, some teachers of the word of God who will explain in more detail. That's exactly what happened here in Nehemiah. They, they, they read it, but then someone had to explain it to them. When Jesus had great crowds following him, do you know what the Bible tells us he was doing? He was, sitting, he was explaining and illuminating it. Mark 12 says, the common people heard him gladly. Now, I understand, there's, there is a group of people that ought to go to Bible college and that they ought to spend their lives studying the Word of God. But I, I got honest, for, from, some, from someone who's been to Bible college, from someone who's been through seminary, let me just tell you that some of those guys, they, they speak a language that I can't understand. Come on, you know what I mean? I mean, they're using all kinds of terms, and, and, and I'm like, where is that in the Bible? No, we, you know, this is what it means. And you go, well, I don't know what that, I mean, I, I used one a, a few minutes ago called pneumatology. It's the study of the Holy Spirit, right? And they, So you need sometimes someone to explain Scripture to you. Uh, uh, the, the people here were, were, were people that needed to understand the handling of the Word of God. The great theologian, the greatest theologians, the greatest pastors out there explain the Scripture so that the common man can understand. And, but the goal of... of, of bringing you into a place where you can understand that's why we, that's the very reason that we have classes you ought to be involved in those and the, by the way the goal of our teaching and our preaching should be the same it happened right here in chapter 8 and it leads us to the last point that I wanted to make here and that was there was a heeding to the word of God look back down at your Bibles then verse 9 then Nehemiah who was the governor and Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go, eat the festival foods, drink the sweet drinks, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your refuge. So the Levites silenced all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. Then all the people went away to eat, drink, and send portions, and to celebrate a great feast, because they understood the words which had been made known to them. There is a joy that comes when you understand God's word. The old British evangelist Gypsy Smith told of of a man who said he had received no inspiration from the Bible, even though he had gone through it several times. Gypsy Smith looked at him and said, you let it go through you one time and it'll change your life. Amen. You see, we have to let God's word go through us. We must regard and heed the scriptures. And all of this, really, we see the ingredients to revival. You know what this world needs? You know what America needs? Revival. We need revival. Some of y'all understand and you go, man, I remember going to revivals and I remember, you know, back when I was a little kid sitting on the, on the pew with my mom and my dad and God just, you could just feel something in the place where God was just speaking to us. That's what we need today. That's what we need. We need to get serious about the word of God. Dr. Adrian Rogers points out three things that happened as a result over what the people did here in Nehemiah chapter 8. When, when there is a hunger for the word and there is a hearing of the word and an honoring of the word and a proper handling of the word. And when people heed the word, we see that first of all, the people mourned. Did you see that? Verse 9. The people mourned. The people wept and mourned. Why did they do that? They realized their sin against God. That's what God's word is a mirror to you. And you'll see how wicked our sinful natures really are. When was the last time you were broken to the point that you wept, mourned 
we're ever going to see revival, it'll start by a recognition of God's word and mourning over our own sin. When I graduated from high school, my mother gave me a Bible. And in the fly leaf of that Bible, she wrote these words. She said, Joel, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. No truer words I don't think have ever been written. The psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Sin ought to break us. And when we get a proper view of the holiness of God, we will realize how wicked and sinful we really are. We'll see our unworthiness and we'll mourn over our sin. There is a time for that. But then notice, there was a time where the people rejoiced. I believe there's a time for repentance. There's a time for mourning over our sin. But there's also a time to rejoice. Verse 10. Then he said to them, go eat the festival foods, drink the sweet drinks, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to the Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your refuge. Now there's a time for weeping and mourning and repenting. Praise the Lord, we have a God who sees and wants to pick us up and have us rejoice. I love coming each Sunday to see people rejoice. And I realize some of you come into the, to the house this morning and you're broken. There's some things going on in your life and you're, you're, you're hurting. And I understand that. God sees that more than anybody. But there's also a time to let God renew your strength so that you can rejoice and worship Him. The joy of the Lord. I love seeing the joy of the Lord on people's faces, don't you? One of my most favorite things in coming into God's house for is to see other people who have the joy of the Lord on their face. John 15, 11, Jesus said, These things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Lastly, notice that the people obeyed. Why did they rejoice? Verse 12, Then all the people went away to eat, drink, and send portions and to celebrate the great feast because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Isn't, there some, isn't it something when you kind of, a light comes on, you understand a verse you've been reading? Amen. You understand what God's really speaking to you about? Then, then that light comes on, and then you go, I got it. Now I can go live it. Amen. I can go. You see, the word of God is essential. It's essential. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and follow it. There's a lot of people that hear the word of God. We have people that come in every week, watch online, they hear the word of God, and by the time they get in their car and get to lunch, they've pretty much forgotten about whatever they heard. And Luke said, now blessed are those who hear the word of God and follow it. I know there are a million reasons why people don't give credence to it, why they don't read it every day, why they don't study it, why they don't meditate on it. We're busy. We, we're, we're busy people. We have things to do. And we get overwhelmed. And the truth is, is that it gets easier. It's easier and easier for us to just kind of shut it out and become numb to it and shut ourselves down and get jump on social media where we don't have to do a whole lot of thinking, flip on Netflix. And we make excuses when it comes to our Bibles. We don't understand it, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading it because I don't understand it. And, and, and Pastor, I don't even know where to start. And, and so maybe today, we just need to ask God to help us. You ever thought about that? God, would you just help me? Give me understanding. I'll read it if you just illuminate it for me. If you just explain it to me. If you just help me to understand it. And I'll go get in some classes where somebody else can explain it in more detail. And I can raise my hand and ask questions. Would you just ask God to give you a desire and a hunger for his word? Because when we hunger for his word and we hear his word and when we honor his word and then we, we learn to handle his word the right way and heed what he says, God always delights in our obedience to his word. And when we obey God's word, then it brings joy 
and the joy of the Lord is our strength, the psalmist said. Now let me ask you, do you have a relationship with Jesus based on the essentials of the Word of God? Do you love it? Do you read it? You see, it is inerrant. It is infallible. There's nothing wrong in this book. Every bit of it was written for you. Every bit of it was written for, for us to get, to understand, to help us. And when we, we do that, it will bring us joy. What we need to do is pick it up and read it and believe it and obey it. That's what God wants. Would you bow your head for me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus today, the only way you can have a relationship with Jesus is for it to be based on the Word of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. And so I wonder today, if you won't ask Him to forgive you of your sins, to come into your life, repent, believe that he died and rose again. And you can do that today by just simply praying right where you're at, quietly to the Lord, and just say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And I repent today. I believe that you rose again. I believe you're preparing a place for me. God, I need you. Oh, how I need you. And I place my faith in you today. Oh, if you did that today and you're here in the building, we'd love to connect with you. Just give you some more information on how you can begin your walk, your journey with the Lord. At the end of the service, if you would just see Pastor Mike or Pastor Jed or myself or Pastor Royce or go through those doors in the back and turn left. There's a place back there. A guy by the name of Josh and his wife Erin will be back there and they would love to just connect with you, see how we, they can pray for you and help you. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer today, would you send us an email? And let us know. We want to rejoice with you what God just did. Don't be ashamed of what God's doing in your heart and in your life right now. The Christians, will you just ask God today to give you a hunger for His Word? A hunger for His Word. Tell Him you believe that in this book are the words of life. The wonderful words of life. Ask Him to help you hear His Word, to honor His Word, to handle His Word the right way. And to heed to his word, to obey what he tells you. Father, thank you for your word. For it is God breathed your very words. It's factual. It's accurate. It's true. It's alive and it's powerful. Active. God, would you grant us understanding and grace as we read your word, as we look into it, help us to use it as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you that it is essential for our lives to help us to be what you want us to be. Help us to love your word, to study it, to believe it, to obey it. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.